Have you lost your first love for Jesus? Have you lost your first love for Jesus? I want to read to you tonight from Revelation chapter 2 and the opening seven verses. And Jesus is speaking and he says to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden candlesticks. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, and that you've tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You've forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your candlestick from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Holy Spirit says to the churches. This evening for a moment I want us to consider this church in Ephesus. It had a tremendous beginning. It had a mighty history. It was in Ephesus that the Apostle Paul had a Bible study school for two and a half years. And from Ephesus right through Asia Minor the whole province was touched by Jesus Christ and the Gospel. In that area, there was tremendous occult, practices of magic, and the people brought all their books and all their paraphernalia, and they burnt it in the market square in Ephesus, and they lifted up their hands and they declared, Jesus Christ is Lord. This was the beginning of the church in Ephesus. What had gone wrong? Jesus says this, I hold the seven stars of the seven churches in my right hand. Jesus says, I have the leadership of each church in my right hand. And the right hand of Jesus always stands for power. But there was more. He also said this, He said, I walk amongst the seven lampstands. Jesus says, I walk among my churches. I'm there and I'm involved with them. And so our Lord Jesus walks in the churches today. Isn't it interesting how many of us can be negative about our own church? Jesus says, these are my people. These are my churches. And he's the high priest. And for all the negative things you can see within your local church, Jesus still walks in that church. There are times when He will come and He will trim the lamps and He will pour on the oil of the Holy Spirit and anoint that church because the light is getting dim and the light glows brighter again. This is the work of Jesus. Sometimes he removes the lamp. He removes a church. Sometimes Jesus withdraws from a church as he did in Laodicea. What had gone wrong? What had they done? Jesus said, you're neither hot nor cold. I'll spew you out of my mouth. And he says, I'm outside. If any of you want to join me, you come out. That was the mess of the church in Laodicea. But Ephesus, it wasn't quite like that. So what about this church in Ephesus? First of all, notice this. The condition of the church. Not everything was bad. Jesus said so. Look what he said. He said, you work hard. 
you persevere in suffering, you endure hardship, you've sorted out the false prophets because they were false, you haven't grown weary in well-doing, and you've hated the things I hate. But it didn't end there. It was a good church. It was quite a list. But there was something else. There was a serious fault. And Jesus says it in verse 4. He says to that church, you've forsaken your first love. What are you saying, Jesus? He says, I'm saying to that church, you're not loving me as you used to. You've lost your love of Jesus. And that's why you've got problems. The serious part is also this. Jesus had to tell them before the church recognized what was wrong. And as I went through this study, I just pray that I will recognize that I've lost the love of Jesus before he has to reveal it to me. I believe there's pain in the voice of Jesus. You've forsaken your first love. I believe Jesus was hurting in Ephesus because the people didn't love them, love him as they used to. You see, the church is the bride of Jesus Christ. And when a bride has lost her love for the bridegroom, what's left? This is what Jesus is saying. You've forsaken your first love and you're nothing. Then he brings a word. The Lord of the church speaks to the church and he says a number of things. And notice this, whenever Jesus puts a condemnation on us, whenever he says you're out of line, you've lost your first love, he always comes in his mercy and grace to bring us back. And that's what he did in Ephesus. First of all, Jesus says, remember from whence you have fallen. Remember. Don't you remember at first the way you loved me, the way you served me? the way you burnt those books, the way you declared that Jesus Christ was Lord, the greatness of your love for me was tremendous. Things that happened in your church were tremendous. But it's not like that now. Do you remember what it was like, says Jesus. And then he adds, repent. Repent. Get rid of the pride. Get on your knees. Confess. Say you're sorry. Come back to Jesus. Turn to Him. He says something else. Return to your first works. Go back to the love that you had for Jesus. Back to that simple faith and trust that you had when you first met Him. And when you do that, you'll be restored. What's Jesus saying to us? First of all, I think he's talking to us collectively as a ministry. As Jesus' focused ministry, I think Jesus is saying something. Do we really love Jesus as we did when this ministry began six years ago? I had to stop and pray and think about this. I believe we do. I believe I feel a greater love now than I ever felt six years ago. And more than that, I found a greater freedom in Jesus as I've moved in love with you. I found a love and joy collectively that I mentioned last week that I just appreciate to the depth of my being. I thank my God for every remembrance of every one of you because you love. I really do. I really do. Oh no. We don't please everyone. They leave us. That's right. They really do. And we never will please everyone. Either we don't worship correctly 
or we don't meet that need in the way we should, or we don't ask this person to counsel who knew they were ready for counseling, but we do these things that are wrong. And that's all right too. I know this. I've never found a love of Jesus that I found in this ministry from you friends. And whatever my future holds, I will never forget Jesus' focused ministry and your love. And I will always say with Paul, I thank my God for every remembrance of you. But what about individually? Where are you? Have you lost your first love? As you came into this sanctuary tonight, you don't really love Jesus as you used to. Is that where you are? This all began Wednesday afternoon a week ago. One of our friends said to us, I just don't feel I love Jesus as I used to. And we talked about it and we discussed it. And what I think she was really saying is when she came into an experience of Jesus, she was a babe in Jesus and Jesus carried her. And for a year, it was great. Then he said, okay, now walk. She went, boom. Because you know every one of you who's had a baby. Little toddlers, you put them down, you pad their seats, and they sit on them. Plonk. Christians do the same thing. They do. You accept Jesus Christ. He carries you as a babe. And he says, okay, let's go. Start walking. You go a bit, and you go, boom. And sometimes it hurts. Especially if you're not well padded. But our growth in Jesus is the same as the growth that we see in little children. But then something else happened. Jesus is so neat on this. Wednesday evening, Connie Eastburn shared with us, as she did last Friday. Connie and Bill have had on their grounds those friends from the house of Samuel. Now the house of Samuel are a little group of Christians who are committed to helping little Indian children coming from reservations, who are sick, who are in need, who are destitute, kids with tremendous problems. And what Connie shared with us was this. They were due to leave on the Monday, and one of the little fellows was taken into hospital with pneumonia. One lung was filled up. Monday evening, in went his house parents, and another couple, and they laid hands on and prayed. And by the way, over here is a little one who's had a fever for a month. The medical world can do nothing. So they prayed for him too. Tuesday morning, no fever, go home. Tuesday morning, check the x-rays on the lung, no liquid, it's all gone, go home. And immediately in my spirit I react to that. Why is it, Lord? Here are these people, they pray, it happens. They pray, it happens. Why don't we see the same? And I asked Connie, which is quite unfair, but I asked Connie anyway. And several things that she said just stuck in my mind. These Christians in the house of Samuel have nothing. They've given up everything for Jesus. They're often right at the end of their finances. But they spend days chatting with the Lord. And if any crisis comes, they immediately turn to prayer. As a group, they got together each evening to pray. And a number of times, Connie said, how they would have a prayer over something, this, that, the other thing, all the time in contact with Jesus. And as that spoke to me, I wonder if we've lost the first simplicity of working, walking with Jesus. We get into the Word of God and we get into Bible study and we get into theology and we begin to lose that first simplicity, which is simply taking the Word of God and believing it and standing on it and praying and saying, Lord, you've said it, now do it. And that's what these friends did. And he honored that. And I think maybe as Christians we become so sophisticated that we can't find the simplicity 
And yet Jesus said, unless you become as little children, you won't even enter the kingdom of heaven. Simple faith. Simple trust. It happens on Friday evenings. You come here with a physical problem. The close of this part of the service, I say, if you have a physical problem, come and stand in the center aisle. And you turn to your friend and say, maybe I'll go. You've lost it. Don't bother. Go home. You lost it right there. Maybe it'll do me good. Forget it, it won't. You've lost your faith. The woman in the Bible said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. And she touched it. And she's whole. I always come back to those two saints that my wife overheard outside there. Dear, I thought you were going up for prayer tonight. Well, I was, but I don't feel well enough. <laughs> Hallelujah for a ministry of healing. Good job Lazarus didn't feel like that. He'd never come out of the grave. He felt terribly dead. Terribly dead. Oh, yes, dear, I'll have a prayer. It won't do me any harm. And it won't do you any good. I see in Scripture that everyone who came to Jesus was healed, without exception. Physical, emotional, spiritual. Jesus wants His people whole. But we don't all believe that. We really don't. So what can we do? Same as the church as Ephesus. Remember where you were in Jesus when you first found Him. Take a look back for a minute and ask yourself, have I lost that first love? Have I lost that first enthusiasm? What we saw with our friends from the house of Samuel, when they prayed, they knew, they expected with all their hearts it would happen. How many of you, when you come in on a Friday night, Expect great things for God. We have a God who can do anything. But we don't all believe that. The second thing is this. If you've lost your first love, repent. Get on your knees. Confess. Say to Jesus, I'm sorry. I want to be back where I was with you. And ask to be restored. And then return to your first works. This is what Jesus told them. To that simple love, to that simple faith, to that simple trust, to a total belief on the Word that what God says He'll do. Because when God makes a promise, He cannot break it. By His nature, He can't break it. And He won't. And also, and Ted talked to you about this, Leave your pride. Bury your ego. And come to the cross of Jesus Christ with absolutely nothing. Leave your success. Leave your material possessions behind and come to Jesus just as you are and acknowledge to Jesus that you're nothing. I live because He lives. I'm what I am because of Him. Not for any other reason. And at the feet of Jesus, I see I'm nothing at all. And He is everything. When you come to Jesus like that, and when you come in total simplicity, and when you lay aside your sophistication and your pride and your ego, and all that you think you are, and begin to be nothing, He will pour out an anointing of the Holy Spirit with miracles beyond anything you can even imagine. He will pour it out through you, on your life, to His glory, and He'll begin to do it now. If only you come to Him in total repentance and say you're sorry. Let's pray.
Lord Jesus, some of us who've been filled with your Holy Spirit just believe we've got everything. And yet, Lord, if we've lost our first love, we have absolutely nothing. And we are nothing. And we need to return. And we need to do it now. Father, in these moments, by your Holy Spirit, speak to every one of us that we may be the men and women you want us to be. That you may be that we may be the men and women that Jesus prayed we would be when he knelt in the garden on that last night. That we may be the men and women that he died that we had become. Lord, restore us to our first love. And we thank you. Amen.